I had, this is, I think, version 15 of this that I wrote because I have had been doing this so long, I've made many mistakes, and I love to give advice. So <laughs> it's, I, I, I just want to say it's painful to me to get it down to this particular one, but I hope it's going to be helpful. Um, first lesson learned, this is me at oh. IBM. Uh, oh. <laughs> And uh, I graduated from college early, and I went to work for IBM, um, and I was uh, an attitude problem. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be astonished to learn. Uh, and when they wanted me to quit, uh, when they wanted me to, no, they wanted me to stay. I quit because I used to sneak off to the bathroom to read uh, uh, English novels. <laughs> and, uh, but I liked the programming, but I also liked doing crosswords. I liked, I liked um, uh, geometry in high school. It just wasn't the meaning of life, so why should I be doing this? And, uh, um, uh, and, uh, but when they wanted me to stay, they said, well, look, you could do humanities at IBM because we've just started this thing and somebody had written an article about counting words in Tolstoy. <laughs> and this is an actual quote I've remembered after all these years, uh, <laughs> that this was man's greatest output. So by the time I finished responding to that, they said, well, probably you should never be hired by IBM again. Uh, uh, but this was part of what became a productive approach, and eventually the TEI was just looking at, at, at text computationally. But it uh, didn't interest me. So I went to uh, Harvard, and I, I made them give me a special, uh, for then, uh, new concentration in narrative. Uh, and it was the beginning of the women's movement. I taught some of the first women's studies courses, first at Harvard, and then before I got my degree even at MIT. Uh, and what I was interested in was what was left out of the English novel. Uh, so how come George Eliot was having sex but not talking about it? Okay. And how, why, how come their lives were so much more complicated? So what was it about the form of the novel that didn't stretch itself to what I really wanted to know about people's lives? And how did the novel change in order to express different outcomes? Um, and I, I did some social history uh, around that. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so how, this is the same idea. You can read it for yourself. <laughs> so, uh, and then, so that was my uh, disciplinary background. Then my religious background, which I, I, I had the conversion experience at MIT, and those who were alive during that time will know that this was religion, uh, was uh, LISP, uh, which um, was this, uh, which also coincided with the introduction of object oriented programming. And uh, did how many did people here study with this book with Abelson's? Uh, yeah, I still teach it. Yeah, still God bless them. So artists. it was bliss. And the, and and Hal Abelson would stand there, and he really saw himself as a wizard, right? <laughs> and uh, and he and uh, he. Well, I could do my whole. The, <laughs> ask me about that. Uh, it, the, yeah, the, what what. What that way of thinking uh, uh, represented for me was this insight that uh, computer code was not just for making uh, somebody's payroll run faster, but that you could represent the world and that you could do it with words and that those words were then executable. And it was just magic. And there was that one moment when he held, when he explained, I kept thinking, how did they do this? Because they had taught me um, uh, systems programming at IBM, uh, and we had to do compilers. So I kept thinking, how did where do those parentheses go? And he <laughs> then at the end of the the uh, the uh, course, he described how to make Lisp run on a register machine, and it was as if he was describing like a crude sketch of what the inside of a brain might be like, you know. So not. 
uh, to fall into the cognitive trap. <laughs> but, but it was definitely a very powerful way of thinking about how culture itself is encapsulation. Uh, and I realized that uh, these powerful <laughs> computing systems were uh, encapsulated systems of abstraction. And those things collapsed for me. Uh, and then my students showed me Eliza, which I, I've written about elsewhere. And I thought, this is like looking at Robinson Crusoe and thinking, how do we get to Virginia Woolf? You know, it's like, God, you know, this, this is a system for representing the world. And then, um, oh, and then all, all, at this time, there was this interest in using it for learning. Uh, and I was particularly, you know, in that same uh, uh, Lisp religious uh, order was Papert and, and Logo and Microworlds and the allied idea that you could learn actively. Um, so, uh, and I'd been working in all these active learning things at IBM, any, at uh, MIT, anyway. So then, Deck, may they rest in peace, and <laughs> IBM got, gave a $50 million gift to MIT because Michael Dertusis said, sent them a you know, one-page proposal or something, said, <laughs> we'll put it in all of the, um, uh, in every uh, education, in, in every course at, uh, at MIT. Uh, and he had not actually told anybody teaching those courses <laughs> that this was the case because of the beautiful arrogance of computer scientists. He knew that this is what should happen, and uh, so, uh, so in came this money. Um, and then later on, crucially, came the foundation support, and I must say, that NEH was the most important of these foundations was because it was consistent money in different, uh, particularly in the educational uh, uh, directorate. Every year you could go and they, they, they were peer reviewed and they picked smart things and, and, um, uh, and there was something to sustain it that, was, uh, that belonged to the humanities. But there was this institute-wide effort to introduce computers into learning. Not a clue about how that should happen. Um, and then there was also in another corner, the what was then the Architecture Machine Group, making these cool and inspiring, and some of them educational prototypes, um, like uh, how to change a carburetor. Uh, so, um, and demoing them like crazy, right? Like on the hour, every hour, they'd be in. <laughs> so it was easy to see. Uh, and uh, so Joe Weisenblum, uh, God bless him, uh, who had done Eliza and who was very inspiring to me, I was rather crushed when he said um, that. Uh, uh, why are they doing this? You might as well put cellos everywhere around MIT. <laughs> Not, nobody can, they, yet yeah, programming is a skill, programming is a specialty. Uh, and, but actually, he was right as far as the mathematicians were concerned. Because you couldn't get the mathematicians, honest to God, to give up their slide rules for calculators, let alone listen to Hal Abelson about how wonderful Mathematica was going to be. So, and also, I secretly think that they didn't care about teaching that much. So they didn't care if the students were having trouble. So, the, the, so here, the computer scientists had this wonderful vision, but who was going to implement it? Oh, but, and, and it turned out that the humanities stepped up. But then this is another quote that is seared into my soul. The <laughs> dean of engineering who, who took over raising the money for this uh, actually looked me in the eye and said, well, we've put out all these machines and people are using them for word processing and this is a waste of CPU time. You know, because, so I, I, and this is supposed to be, uh, so the first Pac-Man was the, the idea that computer scientists had that they could swallow the humanities. This is them throwing up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
but, uh, but I will say that an institute of, of, of engineering is a wonderful place because even though there are these disciplinary divisions, there's a laboratory culture. There's a sense, I always used to think of the Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland movies. Hey, let's put on a show. So you go to them, you say, let's make a project. They say, great, what do you want to make? Who's going to use it? Yeah, they, so, uh, okay. um, so, uh, so I refused that lesson that, you know, what are we doing with these cellos? And, and, so, and, um, and as it turned out, the humanities create, had the, got the most money, the fastest, and more than that, had one of the largest and most computationally ambitious projects. It was around uh, language learning. And we were doing, and we got uh, the leading, uh, Bob Berwick was the leading uh, person in uh, natural language processing from the AI lab, work with us, Chomsky students whom he wouldn't fund because he didn't want to take money from the federal government because it might impinge on his politics, so his students were completely without funding, <laughs> all worked for us. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and we also did, uh, and we did a very, uh, very elaborate system, and then we did uh, speech recognition, and, and, we, and most of all, most successfully, and I have written an article, a serious article, Lessons Learned about this project, we saw the promise of interactive video and interactive narrative strategies. And that was uh, completely beyond what they gave the, the computers and the money for. They did not expect interactive video. They didn't want to hear about it because you couldn't do it on a, uh, the IBM machines. You couldn't, uh, tech disappeared pretty soon. You, uh, uh, but our project had a reality to it and then it had funding behind it and therefore the university confronted uh, interactive video. So we, we, uh, we pushed it out of the media lab where it was these you know, spaceship uh, models that worked uh, while uh, the right person was in the room into trying to make something that would work on a shorter horizon for particular users. Um, um, and, uh, and then we were part of the whole uh, flowering of humanities computing in the, in the 80s and 90s that uh, uh, pioneered these different genres. Um, and I won't go through all of the projects, but I, I flash forward to a project that I did at Georgia Tech, again with um, uh, NEH funding. And um, because, and I think this is just a good reference point. It's a very short sure. video. Um, this is 2006, and uh, we had the American Film Institute and Warner Brothers, which took years of lawyers, needless to say, hired by the American, <laughs> or pro bono for the American Film Institute. And, and I, I, I'm, um, so we took Casablanca, the jewel of Warner Brothers, we had outtakes from it. We had uh, the original script of uh, Everybody Comes to Rick's um, that was sent there. We had the memos of production so we knew when things were filmed. Um, we thought about how to segment it and how you would uh, navigate it in order to compare different versions. Here's the first time he says, here's looking at you, kid. Actually shot on the first day. You can see where it was filled into the script. Um, uh, and I think this is the ending. You know, the question of what was added at the end and how much they knew about the ending. Um, so, and then we also had commentary of, of all the people who were in those AFI a uh, hundred years, a hundred uh, films, series, like Steven Spielberg, incredibly articulate, gives you a paragraph that's just, uh, you know, you, he's, he's speaking it, but you can't believe he didn't write it out first. It's just really smart. Um, and, and we thought about where you would put that in the, uh, next to the film. 
And unlike the very uh, random commentaries that you get on, uh, on a DVD second track, we thought about how you might actually sync a, a, an artist community a, a tradition of, tra of practice, which is what uh, movies really are. It's an apprenticeship medium with what you were looking at at this on the screen, so that um, and what our hopes for this was, I was then a trustee of the um, now I'm an emeritus trustee of the American Film Institute, uh, was that this would be a way for them to serve as a broker, so that they could establish an information structure that all of the studios could participate in that would allow scholars and fans to access small segments and to go deeper into film art um, while still retaining the copyright. Hmm. Of course, it was a wonderful idea. Uh, and it, it um, I guess I'll say, it, so here are the things about in terms of, uh, and of course, it never happened. Uh, but, but let's stay with the wonderful idea for a minute. So what, what did I learn from doing this that I think are the design lessons? That the semantic segmentation across media, that people often segregate media and archives, these are the videos, these, you really have to think about what is the subject and, and, and have the segmentation on meaning uh, and at multiple granularities. And that when you do that, you have a different knowledge and you have different discourse. And one of my hopes was that this would take the bullshit out of film uh, scholarship uh, <laughs> because people would stop with the French theory already and they would, <laughs> they would point to something, because anything you said, you'd have to, if you could actually point to something that exemplified it, then we might get somewhere. <laughs> So, um, uh, and, and the other thing that I learned from this and from other projects is that you have to think not about um, remediating the, yeah, like we did another project with Henry Jenkins that was a film textbook. You don't try to do a textbook, you think about what is the core activity. You don't try to do a Shakespeare variorum and reproduce the text, you try to say, we honor the scholarship and then let it grow into the affordances of digital media. That, I think that's the most important design insight that nobody, that, that is too rarely applied, not just in, in, uh, in uh, scholarly research work, but also in applications and commercial applications that people just keep remediating. Um, okay, so why uh, didn't it work? So uh, why, it's still on why it was a good idea. So the industry also wanted to solve this problem. And they, they still have this problem, and they're going to get pirated on it, which is that people will want the excerpts, and people want to del delve into the movie. This is part of our cultural heritage. We should be able to quote it the same way we do a literary text. Um, and to them, this was, uh, this, the problem it was uh, framed as unlocking, meaning how do we make money from movie assets. So we own these things and we're, we're not selling them. How, you know, what's, that's no good. So, uh, um, but they didn't think that the educational market was big enough for them to go to the next stage with it, which was really wrong, but, uh, but uh, that was their decision. Um, and right now, uh, they are looking at doing this as an ebook, which is, of course, an, a, an idiotic idea because <laughs> it is about the film. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, but 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 it's coming along. But you know, so I, it's 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 always for me. I always say it's easy. It's it's, I, I, it's easy to see the direction of change, especially if you've studied English literature or, or the women's uh, history, and you know what takes 100 years, but, but it's coming. But it's hard to tell how long any particular thing will take. Um, so, um, but this is what university research is for, and I just profoundly believe that, that we have to be the ones that ask the long-term question and that figure out where is this going without any concern for the proprietary, 
rights or for the disciplinary boundary. We have to say this is where human uh, cognition, human culture is expanding. Let's try to model it as if we could have it. Um, but I feel so apologetic looking at Brett that we didn't make a lot of money for any age. <laughs> So, um, so the takeaway is uh, that the proprietary rights, they are an obstacle, but, but not uh, forever. And they're not an obstacle to designing it. Um, and the AFI was a great partner here to help us get the rights. Um, and that what you want to do is contribute to the design insights. OK. Uh, I want to say something as well about my uh, educational projects. I think that um, though it's, it's often more honored or more glamorous to do research projects, and often the people who are doing uh, the in the trenches education are the uh, least uh, prestigious people at, uh, you know, the untenured uh, or the marginal people at an institution. They are the people who actually have a hands-on notion of cognitive glitches. And so they can be wonderful partners in design. Often they hate computers, <laughs> uh, or they distrust them, or they're just too busy to do something different. But, but those are people who c care about, and then sometimes they have tenure, and, and sometimes they're prestigious uh, physicists. But the pe but people who care passionately about education are really good partners for making really uh, 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 transformative projects. Um, and the reason is that, and, and I've learned this from doing projects in, um, in the sciences too. So this intel that got tech at EDU, if you wanted to follow that, that's a STEM project that we did with a lot of money from NSF. Um, to uh, help women and minorities relate to the basic engineering course of statics by making real world examples. Um, but I, the same processes that I saw with the foreign language teaching, I saw with this. Uh, and that is that when you take knowledge in any field into a new medium, this new medium of representation, you are profoundly disrupting the epistemology. So that you all of a sudden, you have to ask the question, wait, what is knowledge of a foreign language? And it turns out people don't know. Uh, and how come I'm making these things to teach people how to learn statics, which is how to make the beams to keep things up, but I can't make an application, a, a Papert-like microworld in which things fall down, because that would be dynamics. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, I should have noticed this. <laughs> you know, the course was called statics. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's one of those things we just did. It's a good reason to have a seed project before the full proposal. Uh, but, uh, and, then, um, and then you realize there's no reason why dynamics should be taught separately from statics, except that it's too hard to do with books. But it would be possible to do it with models. And then it's too hard to teach dynamic statics together because you'd have to disrupt the whole uh, ecology of the course. In fact, you can't even get the professor next door to the one that you're, right, you're working with to even use these exercises <laughs> where the things don't fall down. Because, uh, or the book that, uh, that's a little bit more adventurous that has real world examples. Um, so, um, so Addressing those epistemological profound questions, this is where I think funders really could make a big difference. Finding some kind of sandbox, finding some arena, give people the breathing room. And it can't be, sadly, with all of this new hoopla about, uh, dis about you, you, you know, universities teaching on the web for free everywhere, because they're just taking the lectures, and they're trying to do it as fast as possible. So that's not the way to do it. But there has to be some place where you say, how do we reconfigure knowledge? 
Uh, because that is what happens when you have a new medium of representation, as with the printing press. And we're not making fast enough progress there, because nobody's getting rewarded for it. Nobody's getting paid to do it. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, the other thing that surfaces from this that's so exciting, it's wonderful to be in the room for this kind of a project, is that um, the teachers actually have, uh, they have a model of the learner. So they know that to be a language learner, for instance, you have to ignore the word. You have to listen intermittently. A successful learner does that. Uh, or they know that to think like an engineer, you have to be able to make this free body diagram, and there's a particular mo uh, abstraction from the real world to that diagram, and the diagram is a solution. And there's certain, and then if you watch them do it with the right, uh, learning specialist, you see that it's embodied knowledge that they're doing that. So that, and again, you have to sense this is just out of reach, this knowledge, but we, it, it's wonderful to tap. Okay. So what's opposing this? Well, one thing is the robot of death. Uh, um, um, there's another lesson refused. So every so often there is a book, usually negative, that says video games will bring an end to thinking, or Google will bring an end to this particular distractible writer's concentration. Or, you know. <laughs> Give me a break. I mean, this clearly is a medium that's making us smarter. And, uh, um, or even then there's this uh, kind of ideological celebration. If we only have the right level of confusion, uh, then we will have undermined the hegemony of the book, and, which is really not worth doing. So, uh, so both of those senses that you just sort of throw a computer uh, uh, that, that, the, that the medium is intrinsically bad or, uh, or good is real, are really wrongheaded. Uh, and um, one of the points that I made in my book, Cameron on the Holodeck, which I, I won't go through all of the lessons there, though I wish I had made one of those maps. That would have been fun. <laughs> uh, that is that there is no moral hierarchy of media. Um, at, but that a new medium has specific affordances that we can maximize. And in particular, it can support more complex storytelling. I mean, that's the thing that, that drew me into it. That's why I wanted to work with the language uh, teachers, because they had these simulations that were narrative. And I began teaching interactive narrative, a course that Nick took and now teaches. <laughs> and. Um, uh, I'm okay, I'm way out of time. I'll be done. <laughs> okay, so what do I do? I do interactive narrative around television. I think television is a great way to think about it. Um, and um, you can look at my website for that. They're summarizing, there are these mod obstacles to remaking knowledge. Um, and I think that the way to overcome them is to focus on genre. Um, and, I, and I won't repeat what you can see there. Um, uh, and I, uh, all of this uh, is in my book. Uh, and you can teach courses with it. That I'm, what I'm hoping is that people would teach courses out of the humanities to teach design. Uh, because we need to draw on that notion that it's genre making. And it's genre making that, that co-evolves the technological development. Okay. Um, and here are the opportunities, my last slide. Here are the things I think we should do. So I think digital editions or archives that radically reconfigure the work and the discourse around the work. That people are continuing to do these things, but they're not doing them with that, uh, with pushing that envelope. Um, and then narrative systems, which I know other people are, are really invested in and then have a lot to say about too and I'm eager to shut up so other people can <laughs> talk about it. Oh and send me your graduates. <laughs>